uh, describe five other cities that have either advanced meter reading, um, metering infrastructure, or smart grid projects already underway using wireless mesh. Um, and feel free to, to jump in at any point and ask questions. Um, I'm here um, also with, with Narsi Machari, who's a founder and CTO of Tropos, and Rob Pilgrim, who's the VP of BizDev. So if there's anything that I don't know, I'm sure they, they can fill in as well. <clears throat> so what is the smart grid? Um, I think there are a lot of different um, opinions and definitions, but this is, this is sort of a paraphrased um, list from the Department of Energy. Um, the characteristics are that it needs to self-heal, um, and that's, that sort of contrasts with the, the self-destructing nature of the, of the grid in 2003 when we had the big blackout in the Northeast. Um, and even, you know, right now in the Northeast, there's, there are people without power, um, partly because a lot, of the, a lot of what happens with the transmission and distribution system is, is manual. There are not a lot of communications built in. Um, so that, that self-healing is something that, that um, you know, the planners are really looking forward to in the, in the smart grid. It enables active participation, and that can be either manual or, or automated um, for the end, end users of the, of the electricity. Um, it can be displays in people's homes that give them real-time information about electricity pricing that allow them to modify their, their behavior, or it could be um, talking all the way down to the machines, to the, your, you know, uh, your dryer or your water heater um, or your plug-in hybrid and telling it when to charge, when to give energy back, um, when electricity is cheap and, and clean or when it's expensive and dirty. Um, smart grid needs to be secure, um, so it, it needs to both be protected against physical and cyber attacks and be able to heal itself again, the, fir the first point when, when something like that um, occurs. It needs to accommodate distributed generation and storage. Um, we certainly see plug-in hybrids coming, which are an example of, of distributed, distributed storage. Um, things like ice energy, uh, AC units that can freeze, freeze water at night when energy is cheap and, and then use it during the day to, uh, to, to cool a building. Um, but you know, certainly wind power and solar power are things that are, that are generated um, not in, in you know, centralized locations, and that, that puts more strain on the, on the grid to, to transport that power around. And finally, um, those, those transmission and distribution assets need to be used efficiently so that they're not wasting that power, and the, uh, the generation as well needs to be, be used as efficiently as possible, and the cleanest, cleanest generation facilities need to be um, need to be used and coordinated. Um, so um, the smart grid really is more than just meter reading, um, as, as I've described. They're, they're, um, you know, if you look at this top petal of the, of the flower there, um, the AMI stands for Advanced Metering Infrastructure. So that's not just reading the meters, that's sending information back to the, to the meters and the consumers. But there are many other aspects of the smart grid outage management, demand management, load shedding, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, um, you know, all of these things require basically communications at their core um, in order to, to you know, make the grid more resilient, um, more efficient, and, uh, you know, greener. Um, if we look at the components or the, or the devices that are part of a smart grid. Um, we have on the, on the left side here um, the either consumers or generators of the, of the electricity, the distributed generation and storage, um, demand response. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the displays in people's homes or smart thermostats, smart meters, sensors in the, in the distribution system, and even the, the linemen and the workforce um, on one side. Um, on the right side, you have visualization software and all of the, the servers and management um, that, that deal with uh, running the grid. But in between, you need a fast bi-directional communications infrastructure. Um, and that's where, that's where wire, we feel wireless mesh comes in. So uh, we've broken it down into um, several, different, several different segments here. Um, Nobody's claiming that there's a single mesh technology or wireless technology or communications technology that's appropriate for, for every piece of this, uh, this communications infrastructure. Um, 
on the on the right side here are all of the servers and control systems. Um, and then uh, you know, one implementation is to build an IP mesh backbone um, that that ties everything together in the field here. So it's it's supporting the metering and the home area networks, as well as the distribution automation and and work for workforce applications. Um, and that's the part that, that Tropos Networks is involved with building. Um, for the meters themselves, um, often a more appropriate technology invo involves lower bandwidth, uh, lower frequency communications. Um, often the meters are hidden behind homes. They might be in the basement of an apartment complex. Um, and <clears throat> if there are water and gas meters as well as electric meters, they may be battery operated. So you need a technology that's um, that can you know, sleep, send signals very infrequently um, to conserve battery power. Um, so often a 450 or 900 megahertz um, solution that has better propagation is more appropriate for that layer of the system. And then finally, within the home, when you start talking about smart thermostats and you know, there's a dryer and a, and a water heater there shown in the diagram, um, you, want a, you want an open standard system um, so that devices from many different manufacturers can talk to one another um, and get that information about pricing or about load shedding. Um, and uh, so uh, one of the emerging um, standards that's, that's um, becoming popular is Zigbee for that, that, um, that layer of the, of the network. So let me focus in on the, on, on the IP mesh backbone. Um, and that's, that's sort of the section that we're, that we're working on, we're experts in, um, and tell you guys more about that. Um, so a Tropos wireless mesh is um, you know, it's certainly a, a fast and high capacity technology. Um, we're estimating around 100 megabits per second per kilometer squared. Um, standards based, um, so we benefit from economy, economies of scale. There are millions and millions of Wi-Fi devices out there um, that can connect up. Um, it's fast to install. Um, we've had networks that are where 500 nodes have been installed um, in, in a week. Um, but um, as you can see in this, in this picture here, this is a familiar site for people in Mountain View. Um, it's a small box sitting on, on, the, on the end of a street light. Um, it's powered by a power tap um, right on the top of the light there. So there's no, no electrical wiring that has to be done to install one of these things. So literally the longest part of the install is parking the bucket truck, raising the arm up, and then raise it, you know, lowering it back down again. Um, it uh, uses open spectrum, secure, scalable, self-organizing, and self-healing. Um, and that that self-organizing and self-healing part of the technology um, is something that we'll can look into in more detail here. So um, this is a, a simple example of a of a mesh here. Um, you'll see there are three devices that we call gateways. So they have some, some form of wired or wireless backhaul. It might be fiber or ethernet, or it might be a point-to-point -point wireless link, but somehow they're connected back, um, back to the back end. Um, but the majority of devices are untethered, so they're just sitting, sitting on poles or where, wherever the, the mounting assets may be, and they're just getting power. Um, all of them are sending, sending out beacons periodically so they can discover one another. And what happens is um, they'll determine where their neighbors are, and they figure, they'll figure out, each node will figure, figure out independently the best route to get back to the wire um, or get back to the, to the back end. Um, if a new node is added, um, it will start transmitting and listening for beacons. It'll figure out who its neighbors are. So that's uh, right over here is where, where a new node has been added. Uh, and again, it'll find out um, the best path that it can take either directly to a gateway or it may take multiple hops if that's, if that's a faster and lower latency path that it that it can uh, that it can choose. Um, the um, you know I've I've colored it here so you can see that the the system naturally segments itself into what we call clusters. Um, so a cluster defined as a as a gateway and the devices that are routing back into it. Um, and uh, in the case of a of a single radio um, hardware. Um, each of these clusters can then operate on a, on a, on a different channel um, to maximize spectral reuse and get more capacity. Um, if there's an outage or interference, um, the 
So this link over here on the right side goes down for whatever reason. Um, the node will reroute um, and find another path to keep the keep the uh, keep the mesh working. So again, over here on the on the left side, um, in this case, the the link over here to its old cluster broke, um, but it will scan channels and join a different cluster if necessary to keep to keep operating. And uh, you know, many of our more recent products and and uh, some of the equipment in Mountain View actually is a is a multi radio system. Um, there, there's no restrictions on which radio can be used for which purpose. Um, so meshing or serving clients, um, whichever one is fastest and most appropriate can be used. So in this case, some of these links have converted over to the five gigahertz radio. Others where there's where the, the better propagation properties of the 2.4 gigahertz are still using 2.4. Um, so let's switch over to the to the Mountain View network um, just just as, as an example. Then um, it is primarily a, a public access network. It was launched by Google um, just over two years ago for free wireless broadband access to the citizens of Mountain View. Um, it covers the entire city. Um, there are about 500 routers mounted up on mounted up on poles, so that works out to around 40 to 50 devices per square mile. Um, there's 67 gateways within the city, um, so a, a good fraction of the devices have have some kind of backhaul. And in this case, it's it's wireless backhaul again. There's point-to-point -point wireless links that feed um, feed capacity into the network, um, and that's um, because this isn't a smart grid or meter reading network. It has much higher capacity requirements um, to serve serve broadband to the entire city. Um, so there's uh, you know, there's a high density of routers, and there's um, quite a bit of backhaul um, you know, to serve the whole network. Um, it's important to note that the, the system doesn't require those kinds of densities or that, that number of devices to work. Um, there are other networks where we have as few as one router per square mile, um, and they can still mesh up um, and form a, a very sparse mesh um, for applications like public safety or for, for meter reading. And again, the, the the backhaul, um, you know, just as much as necessary needs to be um, needs to be put in. Um, if they're not high capacity requirements for the network, um, the you know, just a few backhaul points can be can be provisioned. And then, as usage grows or new applications come on board, um, some of the nodes can be converted to gateways to increase the capacity of the network. Um, so, in Mountain View, as I as I said, it's primarily public access. Um, there's in-home broadband. If you have a, a CPE or, a, or what Google calls a Wi-Fi modem, um, that's a, a higher power, um, you know, mains powered device that you plug in and, and stick in your window, um, and that has enough sensitivity and power that it can penetrate a few walls um, and give uh, give access inside a building. Um, otherwise, it's laid out for street level coverage for laptops and iPhones and, and other handhelds. Um, the bookmobile has a mobile node in it. Um, so as they as they travel around and, and stop at different places, they can provide access. Um, and there is actually a meter reading pilot in one of the, the newer newer constructed neighborhoods um, where they're doing uh, doing meter reading for for the water um, for Mountain View Utilities water. Um, so there's a. Uh, <clears throat> Google and Tropos collect a lot of data about the network, and there's some interesting things that, that come out of that. Um, so this is these are some plots and numbers for a typical, I guess that's last Wednesday, um, that, I, that I took the screenshot. So um, there are typically seven or 8,000 unique clients that associate to the network every day. Um, many of those may be unintentional. Uh, if you're just walking around and you've connected up with your iPhone in the past, it may just connect up as you know without without you knowing it. Um, so the the real number that that um, is more reasonable to quote is around 3,000 unique active clients. So those are devices that connect up and transfer at least one megabyte of data um, during during their section, session. But still, that's a that's a you know enormous number of of users in the city. Um, if you look at the number of users. Here plotted over time. This is a this is a month view. You can see that it's higher on weekdays and then it drops down every weekend. Um, so that's uh, 
people coming to work in Mountain View versus those who live here. Um, right in the middle, there's a three-day weekend. That's Thanksgiving right there, so it dropped way down. Um, the opposite holds true for the amount of data that, that traverses the network, though. There's a little bump on weekends here that you can see periodically. Um, so it turns out that that's when people are doing more downloading and uploading. Um, even, even with fewer users, there's more overall traffic that, that gets passed on the weekends. Um, and that, that works out to about, well, for this particular day, 358 gigs downloaded and 107 off. And we've seen um, days where there's over half a terabyte transferred up and down um, over the course of a single 24-hour period. Um, so that's, that's a huge amount of capacity. Um, and that's something that we've, we've had to work pretty hard to be able to uh, be able to achieve. Um, so, um, toward those goals, toward, toward getting that kind of capacity and reliability, um, we've had to look at the resources um, in the network and, and figure out how to use them most efficiently. Um, there's not a lot. It's, it's an unlicensed, um, you know, it's, it's using unlicensed spectrum. Nobody's gone out and bought, bought spectrum here. So we have about 180 megahertz in the two bands that we're using. Um, that works out to, to eight non-overlapping channels that can be, be selected by the routers. Um, so we have to do more than just pick, pick the channels that are available to us. Um, and one way is to um, look at the resources as a function of location. So by adjusting the power transmitted from the devices, we can um, use up spectrum in a small area or a large area and use, use only as much as, as we need to um, in order to get a signal from point A to point B. Um, directionality is also important. An antenna array can listen only in the intended direction and cancel out un un unwanted signals coming, coming from other directions. And finally, there's, there's polarization, which is the, the final component of the, of the airtime resources that we have to work with. Um, so let me look at the first one here, which is the, the spectrum and the channels that are available. Um, so uh, there's a lot of information in this map. Um, there are, uh, as you can see, there's, there's square and round icons. The squares represent gateways in the network, so those have some kind of backhaul. And the nodes are, or the untethered devices that just are getting power are the, are the circles. Um, you can see that they've clustered up um, into, into a cluster of nodes around every gateway. And um, each one of them has chosen a different channel represented by, by the color here. Um, they're, you know, some, some nodes taking two or three hops, some going directly to a gateway. It just depends on how the, how the metric works out, which path um, the device computes will give it the fastest throughput and the lowest latency. Um, over here on the right side, there are some devices with, with two colors. Those are dual radio nodes. Um, so there's um, the inner color represents the channel of the 5 gigahertz radio, and the outer color is the 2.4 gigahertz radio. Um, so th for the most part, they're actually using their five gig radios to mesh and then picking different color channels to support client devices um, and, and uh, using, a, using actually a different channel than their neighbor in order to get um, as little overlap as possible and the most capacity. Um, so this, all of this happens automatically. Devices are listening for noise and interference, and they're also looking at the channels of their neighbors in order to figure out how, how to get a good link but not interfere with their, with their neighbors whenever possible um, so that they can get the most spectral reuse and the most capacity out of the, out of the network. If interference um, is detected, um, then the devices will automatically switch channels so they can keep working and have a, have a robust link. Um, um, so as I mentioned, airtime really is that resource that needs to be used efficiently here. Um, the network and the management system collects a tremendous amount of data. Um, this is just a screenshot from our, from our management console here. But you can see hour by hour, um, there are not only performance measurements that are being done, so this is, these are throughput tests that are done several times an hour, um, showing the results in megabits per second, the latency of the network, you know, channel that it's operating on, number of hops, number of clients that are associated. Um, but we're monitoring the airtime which is the fraction of time that the spectrum is busy. Um, so here, broken down into transmission, reception, and total. Um, my mouse isn't showing up. So as an example, 
for this particular node during this hour, it was transmitting with a 20%, 22% duty cycle. It was receiving 27% of the time. And if you add in other interference or other signals that it's picking up, it has the airtime is 58.9% is utilized. Um, <clears throat> so um, what we really try to use, do is use that airtime as efficiently as possible and try to prevent it from getting so saturated that, um, that the medium starts to break down when, and devices start to get disorganized and start clobbering each other. Um, so when the, when the traffic reaches this sort of 80% airtime level, when you're using that much, that much of the capacity, um, a, a, a standard Wi-Fi system will start to get disorganized. It'll start to have devices talking on top of each other. And those collisions cause them to step back, rate back, basically start talking more slowly, um, which in turn causes even more collisions to occur. Um, so by monitoring the, the resource utilization, monitoring that airtime continuously, we're looking for this breakdown point and we're trying to prevent it from occurring. We're trying to keep the network right below the saturation where it can continue to use its resources and operate efficiently, but not cross that, cross that boundary. Um, so one strategy is to use power control. Uh, so in this diagram, I'm showing a transmitter in red in the middle. Um, it's talking to its neighbor, but it's also, its signal's extending well beyond the, the, that, that distance that it's trying to close there. Um, so basically all of these 10 other devices have to remain silent when it's talking because they all can hear it. Um, the system looks for opportunities where it can reduce its power and in turn reduce, have to, it'll have to reduce its, reduce its bit rate and, and speak more slowly, but where it can um, reduce this range of interference and allow other devices to operate concurrently. So it's looking for these opportunities for, for simultaneous transmission where just by quieting down a bit, it can allow some of its neighbors to also talk at the same time and, there, and thereby get that, that, get that kind of concurrency. Um, so um, I'll go quickly through, uh, through these next few slides because it gets, it gets pretty technical. Um, but the point is that the, um, with this power curve algorithm, the, each device is trying to figure out who its neighbors are and how much they'll be affected by its, by its activities. Um, so it can see that um, at this end of the curve, if it's transmitting at full power, it's going to knock out 14 of its neighbors in this example, versus if it, if it whispers, um, it, it will only affect two of its neighbors. Um, so it's making this trade-off between uh, using up the resources for itself and being sort of selfish about transmitting at high power and getting lots of, lots of speed for itself versus accommodating its neighbors. Um, so that's something that we do in real time uh, is, you know, on a packet, per, packet by packet basis, adjust the bit rate and power in order to get as much concurrency as possible within the mesh. Um, so the results speak for themselves. By just a, just a small reduction in power on average throughout the network, um, we were able to increase the throughput by 17%, um, really significantly decrease the number of, of nodes that were um, that were getting congested and getting getting low throughput, um, and uh, we estimate increase the capacity of the network by almost you know by almost a factor of two. Um, the other prong of this of this approach of using airtime efficiently is to monitor the airtime and look look for this this sort of saturation um, that can occur, and uh, throttle back only when one of those one of those saturation, saturation events is about to occur. Um, so <clears throat> uh, it's, uh, it's something that, that Google really encouraged us to do. They didn't want to do rate limiting. They wanted to keep the, the network as neutral as possible and not say, uh, you know, cut back on BitTorrent traffic and let web traffic, you know, go, go, go through. Um, so I, I think they were uh, really taking a strong stance on, on, on neutrality there. Um, so they encourage us to find a different solution that would be absolutely fair um, and only cut back on traffic when it, you, it was basically averting a congestion event. Um, so this ACC airtime con congestion control algorithm 
monitors the airtime and only activates when, when the airtime is starting to get congested. Um, and at that point gives out equal allocations to all of the devices in the area. The end result is that um, the end result is that the total traffic actually increases by averting these saturation events where um, the airtime starts getting getting used inefficiently. Um, it keeps it in this efficient regime and actually allows more total traffic to uh, to to traverse the network. So it really is not a rate limiting algorithm in that regard. Um, but uh, enough of the boring stuff. Um, let me get back to some of the some of the other cities where we have networks and talk about how they're using them and uh, you know, how they're they're operating more efficiently and uh, making strides toward toward uh, developing a, a smart grid system. Um, so this is <clears throat> this is one of our one of our first exposures to um, meter reading um, in Corpus Christi, Texas. This was a network that was actually justified. Um, solely for this meter reading application. So they went on and put in uh, put in a 147 square mile network um, that serves water and gas meters. Um, and you know, the, the business case was such that they could justify the entire entire network just to do this meter reading. Um, since then, it's there are other applications that have, that have come on since the network has been built, um, especially for for public safety um, in Corpus Christi. Um, Rock Hill, South Carolina is another example um, where they, they put in the network, they had a, a smart meter project um, and decided to put the network in actually before the, the meters were in place. Um, so they rolled out uh, 32 square miles um, for a, a, an automated meter reading system. And they were actually able to use the network for that meter rollout project. Um, again, they discovered that having that, that wireless access in the city um, allowed them to offer um, public access to residents of Rock Hill, um, as well as get, a, get public safety, police and fire, and city operations on the network. Um, Oklahoma City um, is our, our biggest network in terms of, in terms of size. So it, the, the city of Oklahoma City is actually um, covers a large rural area around, around the, the city center itself, so 555 square miles. Um, and this is an example of a very sparse network where there are only about 1,200 um, nodes in the entire network. So the density is just um, one or two per square mile. It's actually it's denser in the city center, um, and out in the rural areas, they've they've taken advantage of um, storm siren poles. So they have these tornado sirens that have you know, very tall tall poles out in the rural area, and they've mounted nodes on those. Um, <clears throat> the other um, interesting thing about the Oklahoma City network is that um, because it was originally a public safety network, they had very strong security requirements. Um, but that's that's something that's not not foreign to um, utilities um, and the smart grid, where they they really um, want to take security seriously because you know, the, the grid is obviously a, an important part of their infrastructure. Um, so <clears throat> the security, in other words, was proven um, in this in this public safety network. Um, Anderson, yeah. How are all these uh, deployments? How, how hilly is the train? It it really depends. I mean, you you um, you have something uh, you know, down here like Lompoc, California, where it's flat and not very very many trees, in the middle of the desert. Um, so, um, just one node per square mile is all you need to get the the mesh to form and to operate robustly. Um, in the Northeast, especially, it's um, I would say it's not so much the the, the hills, although that 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 causes problems with the, the foliage. Um, but, you know, in the Northeast, you have all kinds of trees, um, and a higher density of nodes, nodes is required. Um, but, yeah, we've, we've seen, um, you know, seen many different environments and adjusted the, the node density accordingly. Um, it'll depend on you know, the foliage and how, how clear, the, clear the terrain is, but also the capacity that's required and the type of device, end user devices that you're supporting. Um, so if it's a public access network and you want low powered iPhones to be able to connect up and have good coverage, that's much different from a meter reading application. Well, I was also wondering, I mean, they were trying to get them to do San Francisco, which is both hilly and has tall buildings and, yeah. and yeah. a lot of buildings. <clears throat> and I know uh, how interesting that would be as a deployment. 
Yeah, that would that would probably be similar to Mountain View in terms of the number of nodes per square mile um, to, to get that working. Maybe maybe a little more. Yeah. How accurately can you model the density requirements before you actually begin med, you know, taking in field measurements? And things like that? Um, we can do it pretty well, and we do it mainly based on experience. Um, it's it's difficult to get. Um, accurate enough data, you know, clutter data, to do a to do an electromagnetic model model um, mm -hmm. beforehand. But just by doing a site survey and figuring out the number of the, the you know the approximate density of nodes that we need, um, we can we can hit it pretty well. And the nice thing about the about the the wireless mesh is that it's so easy to install. You don't have to do it right the first time. If you're putting in a cell tower, you have to you know lobby and get you know access rights and and go through a lot of trouble to get it. You better get it right the first time. Um, if it takes 15 minutes to take down a node and, and move it or put up another one, um, you can do it iteratively. So you put in the mesh, you hold back a certain number of, of nodes, um, and then you drive test it, um, figure out how good the coverage is, figure out how well it's performing, and then you can fill in, fill in the rest of them. And then actually, uh, as a lot of these cities started up very sparse, and as they add additional applications, what's happened is uh, we've added additional nodes to fill in for the different applications or add an additional backhaul. Because, for instance, starting off in Anderson, Indiana, they just they were only using the mesh to backhaul metering data. Uh, that was, that was the, the application that they built the network on. Uh, and since then, they've added a bunch of other applications, and they're using it for mobile workforce type applications for their utility as well. So they can actually do GS maps and do work orders from the vehicle. To do that, though, you had to, the, the one node per square mile was just too thin for that type of application, so they had to add additional nodes in certain areas to get the kind of coverage that they needed. So one of the nice things about this architecture is you can start off with a very sparse deployment to meet a single application, then with the intent that you can layer on additional nodes fairly easily as the number of applications and the type of applications grow over time. Yeah, the cool thing about Anderson is they, you know, they, they put it in for, for AMR, and then they, yeah, they discovered how useful it was, and then they ultimately opened it up for public access. Um, so, so there are hot pots around town. Anybody who wants to can connect up to the network and get, get free internet access. Um, then I think finally, um, Burbank is um, the best example of a smart grid city um, that we've seen so far. So they. They have their own generation facilities, um, and they're really looking to use them as effectively and efficiently as possible, so they can avoid investing in, in building more generation generation capacity. Um, so it really is a two-way metering system, um, and they're doing, you know, as well as communication to um, you know, uh, you know, manufacturing customers um, to do load shedding. Um, they, they have uh, several customers who have these ice energy um, AC units on their buildings. So they're telling the devices when power is cheap and when it's not, and, uh, and already building, um, you know, already working with many of the components of what, what we call the smart grid. Um, and so why do that over Wi-Fi instead of uh, cellular packet data? It seems like there's not that much information there. Well, there's that's that's a good question. Um, you know, there there's you know, and people ask why not use broadband over power line as well. That's that's another um, another technology that's been that's been suggested for for the smart grid. Um, part of it is economics. Um, if it's uh, you know a utility um, has a rate base that they can use to charge for electricity, and it's it's better for them to own their own assets than to be um, than have this liability to have to pay the phone company every month for um, for cellular access, um, and it works out to be works out to be quite a bit cheaper um, to build a to build a Wi-Fi network for this application than to um, you know to pay these fees to get to get cellular data. Um, that's something that um, that you know it certainly has been tried. Um, they're they're metering companies um, that started out expecting to use cellular data to to backhaul backhaul metering data. Um, and have found just as, as a practical matter, if they need to come up with their with their own solution or with a you know with a, a solution that the utility can own and operate um, in order to make it feasible. Um, oh, and the other thing is that is that these networks 
um, you know, there may be enough capacity today, um, but you know, every network that, that w that's ever been built just about um, exceeds its, uh, you know, its, its you know, uh, the, the initial demand. Um, and um, you know, having something that's that's more future proof and has more capacity and has um, has the ability to grow. Um, so a, a, a wireless mesh network can be built out sparse, and the capacity can be added. It can be built on built out incrementally as the so when they're putting on these other applications where they have mobile workforce, they're trying to access GAS data or do asset tracking out in the field, um, you know, the, the bandwidth adds up and, and cellular starts to look a little bit meager. I was going to say it depends on the, on the payback model you're looking at as a utility also. Uh, in the near term, the first five years typically, especially just for an AMI type deployment for meter reading, it's actually cheaper for the first five years to use cellular. But then what happens is you hit a cross point somewhere between the five and seven year mark probably where for that particular application it actually has a, uh, a savings to use the mesh network. Uh, the utilities tend to look at projects in 10 to 15 year increments. When a utility goes and gets approval to go out and put in, put in meters or put in a new system, they typically are looking at a, a multi-year deployment and then operation for probably 10 years. Um, they want to make sure that the, the system that they pick is it's cliche, it's future proof because going back and changing that network is politically difficult, economically difficult, and operationally difficult. Uh, one of the things that a lot of these guys have gotten hung on in the past is the fact that uh, you ever heard of an old thing called CDPD? Cellular data packet data. It used to be what AT&T offered. And then they said, no, we have this new uh, GPRS, so we're not going to support CDPD any longer. So if you happen to have CDPD equipment put out there, we're sorry, but we're turning the system off. You need to do something to replace it. And then what's going to happen is at some point in the near future, uh, probably in the next five years, six years, they're going to have, they've jumped two um, generations of data transport beyond GPRS. So are they going to maintain that GPRS network for just machine-to-machine -machine data moving over the network? Probably not. And they have no uh, restriction as to, to keep it running. They'll just send a notice saying, you know, in six months we're going to shut it off. So now a utility, a PG&E covering 10,000 square miles of California, has to figure out what it's going to do to replace its data collection methodology in a year. You want to be caught in that position, especially if it's a mission critical thing, such as managing and reading your gr the grid. And it's not just reading, it's actually managing. Because where Smart Grid is going is a full two way communications platform, which is going to be more than that, right? It's going to be more than meter reading. It's going to be command and control and other applications, which takes me to the last piece. And that has to do with controllable latency. When you're running over someone else's network entirely, it's very difficult to manage that latency because it goes over the internet, which you may not know how many hops it's going to take, and it has uh, you know, latency that's hard to predict. When you have the network and you manage that network, then you have a known latency between the control point and the end device you're controlling, which allows you to actually do real-time command and control of uh, switches or things on the grid as needed. Uh, without having to deal with latency issues of did that did that switch actually throw or not? So you can prioritize uh, packets and reduce latency on on key traffic. Can yeah. Yes. So then, sorry. Um, no, just one, one other thing about uh, about Burbank. Um, uh, so so Fred Fred Fletcher, who's quoted on here, um, one of the things that he he told us is that one thing that they anticipate in in uh, Car loving Southern California is is you know plug-in hybrids taking off there faster than they will in the, in the rest of the country, um, and that's something where that's that's it's a tremendous amount of power that it takes to charge a charge a, a car battery. It's a lot of energy, um, and it, that's something that they anticipate having to um, you know to accom accommodate with their their municipal utility. Um, so part of the reason that they're embarking on this project is um, you know the anticipation of plug-in hybrids in in Burbank. Uh, can you can you upgrade the, uh, the mesh network software remotely, mm -hmm. so you can roll out new firmware or whatever? Yeah. 
You may want to give an example of what happened in Mountain View about the, the software update that you did. I'm not sure what you're talking about. <laughs> There's, uh, no, no, no. The one we do, actually. Yeah, there, there are two images that... that no, I'm talking about when we rolled the uh, software upgrade out and, and it actually increased the overall network capacity in Mountain View. Uh, about a year and a half ago. Yeah, well, I think there's, um, you know, we, we've we've made significant improvements, you know, as I, I tried to touch on in the, in the earlier slides there. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, we're uh, um, I think, compared to two years ago, um, we're supporting about four times as much traffic as we, as, as we saw then. Um, and that's that's through these algorithms and, and using using the resources more efficiently. And but I think Mountain View... Like lifetime of these devices? Oh. Um, they're really overbuilt, um, so they're they're hardened and they're tested uh, IP67 you know, salt fog tests, um, you know, corrosion drop tests, and all, all of these things. Um, so they're 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 built to be um, to withstand the elements. Um, so we're looking at lifetimes of 10 to 15 years. Well, our current our current actual calculated mean time between failure in the field that we've experienced is running what at like 20 roughly 20 years right now. Yeah, 20, 21 years. That's yeah. like some sort of accelerated life test or something. Right. Well, basically, it's just the number of hours of service, the number of, of units that have been brought back in, the calculated actual uh, from yeah, takes, with units. It, do, it takes serious hardware, though, to, to survive up on a pole. Cause there's, I mean, there's the weather, but there's also um, dirty power. Um, you get a lot of surges and, and brownouts and things like that. It can, can wreak havoc on the power supply. And there's lightning as well. So we have lightning protection built in the units. And we've had, we've had RMAs come back where the where the device is taking a direct hit and the antennas are just blown open, but you just unscrew the antennas and put put new ones on and it keeps working. <laughs> so there's a lot of uh, well, we've iterated several times there on the on the hardware design. There's a lot of uh, a lot of overbuilding that goes into making these things, making each individual unit reliable. And then the fact that it's a mesh means that you don't need each unit to be reliable. It can it can self heal and route around failures like that. Um, so the overall system ends up being extremely robust. Um, so that's basically it for me. Uh, the, you know, you know, to conclude, we're we're seeing the smart grid being built today in cities like Burbank and Anderson and, and, and other places. Um, and you know, a major part of them is you know, central to the smart grid is communications. We think that wireless mesh is a is an appropriate technology for that um, for those communications. Um, and uh, you know, by by basically solving in what in some ways are harder problems, building an access network for Mountain View, building a public safety network for Oklahoma City. Um, you know, we, we've solved the harder problems and we've come up with a, with a system that is, um, you know, really works very resiliently for smart, smart grid applications. Talk a little about congestion as, when you're in an urban environment and there's a lot of home Wi-Fi happening. Mm -hmm. um, so um, that's where the um, that's where two of these algorithms I mentioned um, come into play. There's the there's the auto channel algorithm, which looks at the number of devices that are using that channel, as well as noise level from things like microwaves and baby monitors and things that aren't aren't necessarily Wi-Fi devices, um, and picks picks channels that are that are less occupied. Um, and then there's also, um, you know, what we've what we've discovered, sort of to our surprise, is that the the signal from home Wi-Fi access points is pretty well contained by the walls of the home, um, and that goes both ways. It makes it, um, you know, it keeps those signals that we don't want to hear inside, but it makes it harder to get. You know, those walls keep our signal from getting in as well, um, also, um, and that's why things like these Wi-Fi modems are necessary to get, um, you know, good indoor reliability. Yeah, on the I have one in my window. It has to be in the window. Yeah, yeah. The screens will block it. The stucco will block it. So I think we've we've discovered that. Um, the, most of the congestion is actually our own. It's other devices that are up on poles um, that are, you know, within clear line of sight that we're hearing. So that's why it's it's so important to coordinate the, the channels that they're using, the power at which they're transmitting, and then look for these congestion events and try to try to rate back the traffic when when they're about to occur. So in the context of a, a smart grid. All the devices are going to need to be Wi-Fi capable and be able to talk back and forth. And stuff. How does the this, this looks like it's dealing with part of the problem, not not the whole. It's definitely dealing with part of the, part of the problem. 
Uh, and so Wi-Fi um, is, so, is you know, something that we've chosen for things like the, for the Google Mountain View network. The technology works for, for any wireless technology. Um, and um, the devices don't necessarily have to be Wi-Fi devices. So the meters themselves are often using a proprietary wireless um, you know, technology and are talking to collectors that are then um, then either using Wi-Fi or wired directly into a into a into a node. Um, so that's that's probably the most typical architecture is 450 or 900 megahertz proprietary wireless from the meters going to connect a collector that's wired into a like a Tropos uh, Tropos node. Um, every, every meter vendor has their own sort of implementation of these uh, IMD technologies. So you know, vendors like Itron or G that build these meters. I think the important thing is that it's it's open standard and it's IP based, so that means that a lot of applications can can run on it without modification. Um, now, there's there's the current big news about having free internet available. That there's the empty wireless spectrum, and whoever gets that wireless part of that wireless spectrum has to offer free internet to a portion oh, right. of yeah. users. I think the latest news is it was it hasn't gone. Uh, uh, any any further, but the question is: Will do you think that maybe this wireless technology could be part of how to actually implement free wireless to, to everybody, or is it really just oriented to, to city by city kind of applications? Um, I think we're seeing it already happen to some extent. Um, so certainly for municipally owned utilities, where the city is you know, running the the water and the power and so on, um, it makes sense for them once they've they've justified this network to open it up. Um, you know, it has extra capacity. Why not you know, make the city more attractive to residents by, by giving, them, giving them free access? Um, that may not necessarily be the case for, a, for an independent um, for investor, investor owned utility. Yeah. Um, but I think they, they certainly have plenty of uses for that bandwidth themselves through the mobile workforce and through you know, running their, their transmission and distribution. In like Oklahoma City, it was actually closed in private. I, mean, I guess it technically still is closed right now. They haven't opened it up for public access in Oklahoma City. Yet, have I don't think so. Okay. So, it so it's a network that's been in existence and working now for four years. Uh, and as Cyrus had mentioned before, they've, they've had, from a security standpoint, uh, because it is the primary data communications mechanism that the city police, fire, and those guys use, uh, they've, they've had attempts to hack that network and break into the network dozens of times, and so far they haven't had anybody break into it yet. In terms of, was your question more aligned around like the 700 megahertz spectrum or a... Uh, I think so. Okay. They, the, the latest, uh, the whole thing about um, the empty part of the spectrum that's been off, I think it's been being uh, auctioned off. Yeah, right. that's the C block. It's, um, it's been on the SSU, so it's not actually the auction. It's, okay. Are you doing it on the white spaces? Yeah, yeah. Why did the devices that are judged to know whether I'm on this dimension or not? Okay. Yeah, so that's another example of the license. Have you had um, any issues with like feedback or um, or with like flapping wings causing causing problems in other parts of the network? Um, that's something that that we haven't done. I mean, we model, um, you know, it, it is, there's no central control. So it's, it's distributed intelligence. Each node is making its own decisions as to, you know, what channel to use, for example, and that can affect its neighbors. Um, but that's something that we've modeled, modeled very carefully and we've, we've looked at, we've looked for in real world networks to make sure it's not happening. Um, so there's enough, um, you know, a, a, the, the node will anticipate what effect its actions will have so it's not causing this, this kind of flapping or feedback. They'll, yeah, they'll try to, um, you know, they'll, they'll try to choose their gateway um, intelligently. Um, but yeah, if a gateway goes down, they'll recluster. You know, part of the nodes will go to one one gateway, part part to another, typically. Any other questions? We've got like a minute left. 
Well, I want to thank you, Cyrus, for coming in and talking. Yeah, thank you. It's been really interesting. We actually have something small for you right here. <laughs> All right. I really appreciate it. I'll have to share this with my colleagues. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>